Chapter Eight of the Seven Sleuths Club. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Seven Sleuths Club by Carol Norton. Chapter Eight: Three Letters. The following morning, Colonel Wainwright called the girl into his study, and, laying his hand on her shoulder, he said, "'Little lassie, why don't you try to please your daddy and go to school in the village here, at least until the spring vacation? Then, as you know, you will be able to return to Mrs. Potter's seminary, if you wish.' "'If I wish, Colonel Wainwright,' the maiden exclaimed, "'why, of course I wish to go back there this very minute, "'where I can associate with girls who are my equals. "'I am sorry to seem ungrateful to you, Colonel, "'but I must simply leave this horrid village. "'I wish you could have seen the outlandish girls "'who called on me yesterday. "'What would Adeline Drexel or Muriel Ellingsworth think "'if they knew I was associating with milkmaids and, and butter-churners?' Alfred had told the older man about the joke, which had been played on poor Geraldine, and he had been much amused. Before he could reply, however, the door-bell rang. "'The postman, I expect,' the colonel said, as he went into the hall. "'Good!' Geraldine exclaimed. "'I do hope he has a letter for me from Papa. It's long past time for my allowance, and I simply must have it.' There were two letters for the girl, but neither bore the desired postmark. "'Oh, dear! It is so provoking,' she declared, and then she climbed the stairs to her room. Colonel Wainwright did not tell her that one of his envelopes bore her father's handwriting. Again, in his study, he opened and read the letter. "'Dear old pal, your report of my little girl is discouraging, but we must remember that she was brought up without a mother, and has undoubtedly received false ideas of life from her associates, a few of whom I do not approve. Geraldine had, while in Dorchester, two intimate friends who were very unlike.' Adeline Drexel is a very nice, wholesome girl whose ancestors have been gentry for generations, but my chief reason for sending my daughter to Sunnyside was to separate her from her chosen companion, Muriel Eldingsworth. Alfred has been much concerned about this friendship. He has often told me that Muriel, who is pretty in dull fashion, makes secret engagements with boys of whom her mother would not approve, and she invites my little girl to join them. Now I want Geraldine to have boyfriends, in a frank, open way, but of this sub rosa business my son and I heartily disapprove, and since my daughter hasn't a mother to guide her, I decided that nothing would do her as much good as a winter spent in the wholesome atmosphere of Sunnyside, where the rich and poor play together in a happy, healthy way. Geraldine will feel terribly about it at first, but I am hoping that she is intrinsically too much like her splendid mother to remain a snob when she is convinced that among her class she will not find the worthwhile people. It was mighty good of you, old pal, to help me out in this matter, but if you find the task a troublesome one, pack her up and send her to a good boarding school until I return. I am enclosing a cheque. Do not give my little girl much at the time. Just sufficient for her needs. Some day I will do something for you. Yours, A.L. The colonel re-read the letter, and then, leaning over the fireplace, he carefully burnt it. The cheque he placed in his long pocket-book. "'Poor girl,' he mused, as he watched the last bit of white paper charring amongst the coals. "'How disappointed she will be at first. "'She has many hard lessons to learn, but her father was wise to send her here, "'where the girls are also wholesome and still children at heart.' "'Then his pleasant face wrinkled into a smile as he thought of the prank "'which those same wholesome girls had played only the day before "'upon the poor, unsuspecting city maiden. "'I wonder if she will ever forgive them when she finds out it was all a joke.' She'll probably be very indignant at first. Well, he added, as he turned away and put on his great coat, preparing to take his daily constitutional into town, this winter's experience will prove of what fibre the girl is really made, and, somehow, in spite of her present snobbiness and vanity, I have faith in her. Meanwhile, Geraldine, up in her pleasant room, was seated on an easy chair close to the fire on the hearth. She was reading the letters, which were from her two best girlfriends. Out of the first letter that Geraldine opened, there fluttered a Kodak picture. A pretty yet weak face smiled at, at her. It was Muriel Ellingsworth. It had been taken at the public baths. Tom Blakely was also in the picture, and, as Geraldine well knew, Muriel's mother had forbidden her daughter to go either with that boy or to the public bathing pool. In a languid scrawl, the letter assured her dearest friend that she was just terribly missed, and suggested that Geraldine run away. I do wish I had some money to send you, poor dear, but I haven't. 
I spent the last penny of my allowance buying a pair of silk stockings. They are simply adorable. They have open work edged with gold thread, and of course I had to buy the slippers to match, and they have gold buckles. You remember Mother said positively that I must not have them, and so I keep them over at Kitty Beverley's, and when I go out with Tom I stop there and put them on. As usual, I was asked what I had done with my allowance, but I was expecting it, and I had an answer ready. I said I had given it to the poor baby's milk fund. Geraldine dropped the letter in her lap and gazed at the fire. Lying was repugnant to her. She had always told the truth fearlessly, and has taken the consequences. Then she continued reading the indolent scrawl. Oh, Jerry, dear, I have another piece of news to tell you. Adeline Drexel took it upon herself to preach to me the other day after school. She told me that if I continued to meet boys and go to the public baths and places like that, she feared that I would be asked to leave the seminary. And then, if you please, the minx told me that she hoped the advice would be taken as kindly as it was given. I told her in my best French to mind her own business, and I haven't spoken to her since, and if you are my best friend, you will snub her too. She is expecting a letter from you, but if I hear that you have written her, I shall know that you have taken her side against your devoted ducky Muriel. Again, Geraldine gazed in the fire. All these dishonourable things looked so different in cold black and white. When Muriel herself was telling them in her vivacious, chattery manner, they didn't seem half so, well, yes, dishonest was the word, and Geraldine had inherited her father's scorn for dishonesty. With a sigh she opened the other letter and read the pretty, evenly written words. Dear little neighbour who is so far away, you can't think how lonely it seems to have the big house next door closed up so tight. Every morning I go to the window hoping to wave you a greeting in the old way, but all I see is a drawn curtain and a snow-piled ledge. How suddenly everything happened. Truly, Geraldine, I do envy you. You can have such a nice time in a village, and I have the dearest cousin living in Sunnyside. You have often heard me speak of Doris Drexel, but you were away last year when she visited me. I'll write a little note of introduction, and I do wish that you would take today and call upon my dear cousin Doris. Tell her that you are the friend I love most, and that we have been chums ever since our doll days, though truly my doll days aren't over yet. I have the tenderest feelings for Pagotti Anne, and I tell her all my secrets. You will be sorry to hear that Muriel and I are not on speaking terms. I did not mean to hurt her, but she thinks I did. Now, dear little neighbour, do write soon to your loving, lonesome friend, Adeline. And so she had to choose between them. How different the two girls were, she mused. Both sixteen, but one was vain and pretty, thinking only of clothes and boys, while the other, still a little girl at heart, told secrets to her doll. Geraldine smiled as she remembered the Christmas when the doll first arrived. What happy times she and Adeline had had together. They had been playmates for years, and what a loyal friend her little neighbour had always been. Springing up from her chair, she opened her desk as she thought, I'll write to Adeline this very moment and tell her I am just as lonely for her as she is for me. For the next half an hour, the only sound in the room was the crackling of the fire and the scratching of a pen. Geraldine had made her choice. When the letter was finished, the girl arose and slipped on her beautiful blue velvet coat with its deep squirrel fur collar and cuffs and a jaunty blue velvet cap. Then, going down the hall, she tapped on a closed door. Who's there? The voice sounded as though it came from the depths of many cushions, as indeed it did, for Alfred, buried among them on his lounge, was reading an absorbing story. "'Brother, I wish you would drive me into the village. I have a letter that I would like to mail to-day.' The door was flung open, and the lad exclaimed, "'I'll tell you what, sis, let's walk to town. It's glorious weather, and Dad told me especially that he wanted us to tramp about the way he did when he was a boy.' Geraldine pouted. "'Oh, Alfred,' she said, "'you know I don't like to walk, and certainly you wouldn't expect me to wade through snowdrifts like a country girl.' I do wish I had stayed in the city. When I wanted to go anywhere, all I had to do was ring for Peter's, and he brought around the car. The lad was getting into his great coat, and he said wheelingly, I feel like taking a hike today, sis. Try it once, just to please me, won't you? Be a good pal. Geraldine hesitated. Well, just this once, she said. Then, Alfred, happening to look down at her daintily shod feet, laughed gaily. But, my dear girl, he exclaimed, you certainly couldn't walk through snowdrifts with those slipper things on. Trot along and put on the hiking shoes that Dad had brought for you, and I'll see if I can unearth some leggings. But those shoes are so heavy, Geraldine protested, and I'm sure I don't know where you could get leggings, whatever they are. 
"'Never you mind, sis. You do as little Alfred asks this once. I'll be back in a jiffy.' True to his word, the lad reappeared as soon as the strong hiking shoes were on, and triumphantly he held aloft a pair of warm-knitted leggings. "'Alfred Morrison!' cried the horrified girl. "'Do you expect me to wear those ugly things? Why, I'd be the laughing stock of Dorchester if I appeared in thick woollen stockings like those.' "'But, sister mine, geographically speaking, Dorchester and Sunnyside are so far apart that your exclusive friends are not likely to see you to-day.' At last Geraldine stood arrayed in the first pair of heavy shoes and leggings she had ever worn. As they were walking down the sparkling highway, the boy asked, "'Who have you been writing to? Dad?' "'No, to Adeline Drexel. I had a letter from her this morning, and, oh, buddy, I forgot to tell you. Adeline writes that she has a first cousin living in this town. I am so thankful to find that, after all, there is at least one girl of my own set in this dreadful place. But what I would like to know is... "'Why didn't she call upon me instead of those butter-turners and milkmaids?' Alfred finished for her. Geraldine, who had been carefully picking her way through a snowdrift, trying to step just where her brother did, happened to look up suddenly and saw the shoulders of the boy ahead shaking with silent laughter. Before she could ask the cause of this, sleigh-bells were heard back of them, and a merry voice called, "'Ho there, Alfred Morrison! Through stage for Sunnyside! Any passengers wishing to ride?' Jack Lee and Bob Angel were beaming down from the high seat of the delivery sleigh belonging to the father of the latter boy. Bob often assisted his father after school hours, sometimes acting as a clerk in the busy little grocery, or again doing the rural delivering. Geraldine was indignant. Ride with a grocer boy? Indeed not, she was thinking. Probably a brother to one of the milkmaids. She flushed angrily when she saw Alfred turn back and answer the salutation with a hearty, "'Hello there, boys. Sure thing. I'd like to ride. Would you, Geraldine?' The girl drew herself up haughtily as she said in a low tone, "'A Morrison ride in a delivery cart? Never!' Bob, not having heard a word of the conversation, stopped the horse, and Jack, leaping down from the high seat, snatched off his hat and acknowledged the introduction to Geraldine with as much courtesy as a city boy would have done and what was more the girl's eyes even though they were disdainful quickly perceived that jack was unusually good-looking so too was the beaming face of the driver who called pleasantly miss morrison please pardon me for not getting out but my steed is restless to-day our conveyance is not a fashionable one i know but if you will honour us we will gladly take you to your destination geraldine hardly knew how to reply this boy seemed nice but of course he belonged to the tradespeople and Bob was speaking again. "'Why don't you let me drive you over to our house? The girls are having a sewing-bee, I think they call it. Doris Drexel and all the rest of them are there.' Geraldine looked up brightly. "'Thank you,' she said. "'I would like to go.' If the seven girls seated around the fireplace in the pleasant Angel Library had known that the haughty Geraldine was unconsciously about to return their call, they would have been filled with consternation for the fear that the joke they had played on her would be found out. End of chapter 8